What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi Shrinks and Sneakers.com. So in this video, as promised, I'm going to finish bipolar disorder and I'm going to talk about the evaluation of mania. How do we evaluate a person when they're in their manic phase or how do we screen for mania in a patient who presents to us as depressed and we're not really sure, are they bipolar one, are they bipolar two, are they just major depressive disorder or some other variant in between, right? So we wanna figure that out and I wanna explain how I go about doing that and the way that we might think about these cases. So I said that bipolar one and bipolar two generally require, well, specifically bipolar one requires at least one manic episode and bipolar two requires a hypomanic episode as well as a depressive episode. So a diagnosis of mania requires the patient to have an abnormally persistently elevated or expansive mood or irritable mood as well as three out of the seven dig fast mnemonic uh, symptoms or four out of the seven symptoms of mania for at least one week. So mania requires a week of symptoms and three out of the seven if the person has a expansive or euphoric mood and four out of the seven symptoms if they're primarily irritable. So a little complicated there in terms of discussing it. I'm gonna go through the whole dig fast mnemonic here so that you understand what the primary symptoms we're screening for are. Now, DIGFAST mnemonic is another clever one, just like SIGI caps for depression that we talked about in the previous section. DIGFAST is a mnemonic that was actually, what it, what it signifies is the speed at which a bipolar patient would dig a hole if they were put to the task. So again, bipolar patients increase goal-directed act or increased activity as well as speed. So they're going to dig that hole very, very quick. And that's where this mnemonic comes from, which is kind of weird, but uh, I guess it makes sense to some degree. So dig fast. Let's talk about, first of all, what each of the letters stand for, and then we'll break down each part a little bit further. So D is for distractibility. I is for indiscretions. Grandiosity is obviously G. F is for flight of ideas. Activity A is for increased activity, so a little bit different, but activity in general. S is for sleep or specifically decreased need for sleep and T is for talkativeness. So we're gonna break down what each one of those means and how we screen for them. So first of all, distractibility, what does that mean? So that's an inability for the patient to maintain their focus on a task for an extended duration of time. So they cannot focus on a task for any length of time. Their attention is generally easily drawn to irrelevant external stimuli. I for indiscretion. So indiscretion I think about as pleasurable activities or, or increased, um, increased indiscretion or, use, or impulsive behavior and also uh, increase in pleasurable activities. So indiscretions suggest not only impulsivity but also poor judgment. So this can be things like fast, reckless driving, sexual promiscuity, uh, spending sprees and things like sudden travel. So again, these are impulsive, pleasurable activities that the person is excessively engaged in. G is for grandiosity. So grandiosity would be an inflated sense of self-esteem and increased self-confidence that's out of proportion to one's ability. So again, this is like the person who says, well, I'm starting all these businesses, but when you go to try to figure out if they have a business, they don't even own a single business, right? but they're doing all these business activities. So grandiosity is beyond their, it's beyond their skill set and beyond their abilities. Flight of ideas. So what is flight of ideas? So this is when the patient's thoughts switch quickly from one unrelated topic or idea to another. And it's usually based on associations that only the person understands. So only the person who's talking is understanding how they're making these jumps from topic to topic it will not make as much sense to you as the person doing the evaluation or as a, as a, as a lay person talking to, the, to, talking to this family member, let's say, for example, who is having or experiencing flight of ideas. It's actually not racing thoughts. Some people will you know, put these two together and say flight of ideas and racing thoughts are the same thing. It's not because in this case, what we're thinking about is how these associations or thoughts are understood and connected. So that's what makes it different. With racing thoughts, the thoughts can actually be connected in some logical or coherent fashion, whereas with flight of ideas, they're generally not connected. There's some disconnect there in how these things are presented. 
activity, like I said, generally speaking, mania it involves increased in activity or increased psychomotor activity. So this will be an increase in goal-directed activity. So it could be increased product productivity at work or increased social activity in some cases. Sleep, specifically with bipolar disorder, you want to think about decreased need for sleep. That's very important that it's a decreased need for sleep. So these people can maintain high energy despite not sleeping. Most of us would feel tired, most of us would eventually crash, but when you're in an episode of mania, you can keep going and going with very little or no sleep. So there's decreased need for sleep. Talkativeness, this is another one, the person will be overly talkative. Their speech may be pressured, so you can so they're talking very, very fast. Maybe they're not able to even catch their breath how fast they're talking. And this is defined as rapid and difficult to interpret. So they're talking fast and it's difficult to understand them. Often I'll ask the patient, you know, has anyone in your family or any of your friends mentioned to you you've been talking really fast or you're difficult to understand? That's usually a decent way of presenting this idea to somebody to see whether or not they are able to say, you know, yes or no to that statement. And then you can screen a little bit further and confirm that this is indeed pressured speech or increased talkativeness. The diagnosis of hypomania can be made with the four, basically with the same number of symptoms, so it's either three out of the seven or four out of the seven, depending on what the primary mood state is, euphoric versus irritable, and the difference being the duration of time. So with hypomania, it's only four days. So hypomania is four days, whereas mania has to have at least a week or seven days of symptoms, and those symptoms must be severe enough in mania to cause functional impairment or require hospitalization. So again, I said hospitalization is a good indication that it's mania and not hypomania. Uh, and the last part here is medications can sometimes induce mania. And I had mentioned that like if somebody comes in with a new onset bipolar disorder in the fourth decade of your life, you should be suspicious. One of the things you should be suspicious for is a medication induced mania. The most common examples are steroids, and that can include both anabolic steroids and corticosteroids, as well as amphetamines. So you can see how treatment of ADHD as a comorbidity in bipolar disorder can get a little complicated if you're using stimulant-based medications. With that said, I'm wrapping it there. That's the conclusion of all the topics I wanted to talk about with bipolar. If you have questions or comments, drop them below. If you've enjoyed the content that we're making, please like and subscribe to the channel so that we can keep making content for you.